The BWCA is a 1.2 million acre wilderness area within the Superior National Forest in northern Minnesota. Motorized and wheeled vehicles, building, lodging, and mining are prohibited, with a few exceptions. Permits are needed to enter the Boundary Waters, which allows the U.S. Forest Service to limit access. Many people enjoy the BWCA. It is secluded from civilization and is a popular place to canoe, camp, and fish. In the early 1900s, Minnesota was becoming very prosperous. It had the largest sawmill, the largest open pit mine, and the largest flour mill in the world. People also began to realize that natural resources making Minnesota so wealthy were not infinite. Some of the conservationists turned their attention toward the forest near the border of Canada. Loggers were clear-cutting the forest with no intention of replanting. Fires had also erupted from the dry stumps and underbrush left over from cut trees, devastating towns and woodlands alike. A debate began between U.S. conservationists and the businesses and people living near the wilderness. The bill created in the 1964 Wilderness Act was signed by President Lyndon B. Johnson. This act set aside over a million acres as wilderness. However, the wilderness in Minnesota was given quite a bit of leeway. For example, exemptions were given to allow logging, mining, and even motorized vehicles in the BWCA. Controversy over what was appropriate in the wilderness began, and many people debated the issue fiercely. After the 1964 Wilderness Act was authorized and put into effect, people made their support known in many different ways. Protesters nearly paraded through the streets with floats pushing to repeal the act. An effigy of Sigurd Olson, an environmentalist, was hung in downtown Ely. Signs were defaced, and flyers were hung through the streets of many cities. Bruce Kerfoot, a resort owner from the Gunflint Trail, remembers riding in Grand Marais. It took two years of knockdown, drag out, damn near to kill each other. You know, we stayed civil, but we rioted. Mm -hmm. Actually, we had a we had a march on the Grand Marais uh, District Ranger's office. We cut off their power. We cut off their water. They brought federal marshals in with uh, machine guns to defend themselves because they were afraid that we were going to attack their building. We had media from all over the place because it was a slow media week, and uh, we had protest marches in Duluth. The effect of that legislation is we threw out a senator, we threw out a governor, and we threw out a legislative, a, a congressman. The wilderness debate boiled over during 1978, when another more restrictive amendment was put into place in the BWCA. The 1978 amendment was the act that affected the people surrounding the BWCA most strongly. Bruce Kerfoot lost over 50% of his outfitting business because of it. Well, the 78 amendments were probably the toughest, most uh, disruptive piece of uh, legislation and subsequent management adjustments to our wilderness that we'd ever seen during the lifetime that we've been here in the last 80 years. Managing agency, the Forest Service, uh, brought somewhat restrictive policies to our natural environment out here in the Boundary Waters. And it was not an easy match with the independent, spirited people of the community that enjoyed a lifestyle that really was not encumbered with too many rules and regulations. And you took care of your own nest and you took care of your own environment because you cared but it wasn't because Washington told you it had to be a certain way or that it had to be structured. It was a scary time for some resort owners. Dave Tuttle, the former owner of Bearskin Lodge, tells his story. The first, uh, actually the first draft of the law, I think it was, uh, uh, our, our resort wasn't even on the map anymore. Um, and it turned out to be a mistake, um, which happened a lot. This act also had a substantial influence on the United States Forest Service. People often forget what it's like to be on the other side of the uprising. Steve Shrug, a Forest Service Ranger, lived in Ely during the 1978 act. I was a field-going wilderness ranger based out of Ely, Minnesota when the 78 Wilderness Act was passed. I remember at that time living in Ely, but I also know that the other communities surrounding the Boundary Waters found the passage of that act to be a very controversial as a you know, member of the Forest Service, we could not articulate what our opinions were, but we did spend a considerable amount of time talking with the general
general public about um, that specific wilderness act and how it pertained to the management of the Boundary Waters. I can recall one instance where um, some local citizens from Ely were pretty disgruntled about it, and um, some of the conversations that I had with the public um, up on campsites, specifically up on Crooked Lake, they were they were hot tempered conversations. Um, I never took um, their comments or their candor or their um, you know uh, strong opinions as something that was you know threatening to me. Um, however, one person did pull my ponytail. Not all outfitters were affected negatively by the act. I'm Nancy Seaton. And I own Hungry Jack Outfitters with my husband, David. Its entire life has been um, after the 78 Act. And something that is unique that um, with so many places in the world where everything is allowed everywhere, having an area that's set off to uh, non-motorized use, uh, whether it's hiking or skiing or canoeing, obviously canoeing is the logical use of the area, um, was, was going to set us apart. Like any dispute, there are people still debating the creation of the Boundary Waters, but for the most part, I think the Wilderness Act was a success. The animal balance uh, returns. So, I mean, the wolf population is more than healthy, and um, you get that sense that we are observing nature as, uh, as it would be without us. So, it's, it's a it's a great asset to the country, and um, we feel pretty fortunate to be living on the edge of it.